Toss aside the touchy-feely notions of love in business and recognize the real power it holds. Welcome to the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast with host Steve Farber, drawing on his work with a wide variety of companies from the Fortune 100 to smaller family-owned businesses. Farber shares inspiring interviews with business leaders and proven strategies for how you can create experiences that your customers will love by developing a culture that your employees, teammates, and colleagues love working in. Discover why and how love at the end of the day is just a damn good business for you too. Here's your host, Steve Farber. Hi, this is Steve Farber and welcome to another episode of the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, do I have a good one for you today. You're going to want to read this. You're going to want to watch it. You're going to want to listen to it at stevefarber.com forward slash podcast because my guest today is the legendary Tom Peters. So you probably fit into one of two categories when you hear Tom Peters' name. Category number one is, hmm, who's that? Category number two is, oh, Tom Peters? The Tom Peters? So, if you're in category number one, you are about to make a transition into category number two. Tom Peters, quite simply, is one of the most influential management thinkers of our day. His original claim to fame was a book called In Search of Excellence, which came out in the 80s. And since then, he's written another 18 books. He's got a new book coming out called Excellence Now, Extreme Humanism. But here are a couple of stats that you may find interesting about the legendary Tom Peters. Uh, He's been at this work now for 40 years. He's given over 2,500 speeches in all 50 states, 67 countries around the world to 5 million people plus. He's taken 7,500 flights, flown 5 million miles, has 19 books with a total of 10 million or so copies sold, 600 syndicated columns, 250 miscellaneous articles, 3,000 blog posts, probably close to 100,000 tweets by now. And he is, as you can imagine, incredibly prolific. He has been credited with, and I don't think this is any exaggeration, single-handedly creating the entire management guru genre. He was the first guy to write an incredible book, hit the stage, and start teaching people to implement these incredible ideas, and he's been at it ever since. He's also one of my mentors. I was the vice president of Tom's company from 1994 to 2000, so this is a little bit of a reunion here as well, and it's a great conversation. So many gems. Get out a piece of paper if you still use that, or an electronic sketch pad like I use, or your device, or whatever. Have something to capture some of these ideas, because you don't want to miss any of this. Or just go and read it at the website. So here it is, my wonderful conversation with the legendary, have I called him legendary yet? Yeah, I think that's three times. Tom Peters. Enjoy. Here we are. Tom Peters, welcome to the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast. It's so great to see you, man. So great to see you, Farber. I refuse to use your first name because you never use your first name. So that's that's right. I'm on a first B Farber. That's right. We're on a last name basis. I I do have a first name. It's uh, not often used, however. Among maybe you'd erased it from even your passport. (laughs) So I want to, you know, I do. I have to admit, I get um, whenever I whenever I see you. Uh, whether it's online or or like this, and it's been a while since you and I actually chatted, uh, I get I get nostalgic. Right. I get a little nostalgic, I have to say. So, in my as I was preparing for this talk for this for our conversation, I was I was uh, taking a trip down memory lane, and I want to I want to take you there for a second because I want you to know the impact that you've had on me. And I know you know that. And I know you'd say, well, I know, yeah, whatever. But I want you to hear it from me. So, and I want you to hear it in this way. My first day at the Tom Peters Company was on, I will tell you exactly, it was on May 4th, 1994. 
And I remember it was that day because in my first day at the office at 555 Hamilton Avenue in Palo Alto, I walked in, starry eyed kid, basically, you know, and there was Tom Peters. You were sitting there on the first floor of the office, surrounded by piles of this book, the Tom Peters <laughs> seminar. It You were just you were sending it out to like a thousand of your closest friends in, in advance. That's in about advance. right. <laughs> yeah. And so this is, this is that book that I got from you on that day. It says for Steve, this is before we were on a last name basis. It says for Steve, welcome and congrats on a running start. Tom five, four, 94. That's cool. That's yeah. very, do you know what the Tom Peters seminar was? That book, the book was, in 92, Liberation Management came out, and it was 900 pages long. The doorstop. Yeah, a doorstop. That's what one of the reviews viewers said in Business Week. He was actually a good friend. He said, if you don't like the book, it'll make a great book. Doorstop, to which I responded, fine with me. The royalties are the same. <laughs> uh, but and, and so the Tom Peters seminar was essentially the, uh, the, the short version of that book. Right. And and I remember that was the first time uh, you you had written a book with actual like, you know, pictures in it and stuff. Yeah. The, the formatting was very unique. And Thank you. that what well, we have to take a two minute, two second interruption. Thank you to my friend, Ken Sylvia, who designed several of our books thereafter. Yeah. He's doing 100 percent. Great guy. Yeah. Very cool stuff. And this was also the time where I remember you said you discovered the power of lists. When you, your, writing, your writing style started to change, you started to write more list, you know, the, like, like your, you know, your, uh, your most, your, your book that's coming out here pretty soon, um, you have, it's essentially a list as well, right? Absolutely. And but I'll take, I'll let me tell you, I lied about, or you lied about starting then but you're right about the importance. Back when Search of Excellence came out, the number one, two, and three books on the list were Ken Blanchard's The One Minute Manager, In Search of Excellence, and John Nesbitt's futurist book, the name of which I can't remember. And Ken Blanchard had been my roommate at Cornell, and I ran into Kenny somewhere, and he said, well, he said, you know why we're number one, two, and three? And I said, no, Kenny, I have no idea. He said, because we all have lists. And, you know, he had he had a list of three. John had whatever he had. We had the eight basics of excellence. And, you know, he was. And, and, and then to get reinforcement out there in the Bay Area, and you re may remember it, and I doubt that it exists anymore. There was a magazine called Sunset Magazine. Uh, and the boss was a guy by the name of Bill Lane. And Bill attended one of my seminars in Palo Alto. It was after the hard paperback had come out. Yeah, well, he said, I bought your book for everybody in the firm. He said, I just bought another copy of the paperback because the first page has a list. And there it is. <laughs> so, I mean, so fast forward. <laughs> it's right. But fast forward to today, your new book that's coming out is called, well, you've got, you've got Excellence Now, Extreme Humanism, but kind of the precursor book that's already available on Kindle is Excellence Now, The 43 Number Ones. So it's a list. It's a list of number ones. Totally. Yeah. You're right. Lists work. So well, you, know, you know, I mean, the lists work, A. Storytelling works, B. The thing, I, you know, there are a million books on storytelling now, but the one vignette I remember was one of the first books on storytelling was a guy who worked for the World Bank and gave presentations. He said, what I learned about stories was a good story could wipe out 250 pages of analysis and unreadable graphs. And I mean, it's, well, it's not funny because right now as we go through all this conspiracy theory stuff, we see people getting literally engaged to insane stories, but they are such powerful nuggets. And You've used them forever and I've used them forever and I hope and I think it's true, at least in your case, it's mainly been for the good. 
but stories are is as bad powerful as they are good powerful. So I, you know, when, 280 uh, characters or less, F up yeah. the entire world, right? Right, exactly. Um, where are you well, living? Wait, no, where are you? Where I'm are in you? San Diego. You're in San Diego, okay. Yeah. Yeah. One of the good guys. Our Palo Alto is not what it used to be, and I'm unhappy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I want to get to that in a second. One, one other little bit of nostalgia, especially since uh, uh, given what you just said about stories. So back in, you know, when I first started at the Tom Peters Company in 94, um, I was a budding writer and, and I, had, I, I was an aspiring writer. And I had written at that point a bunch of essays on customer service and, you know, and shit like that. And I, I drummed up the courage to share them with you. And I left them in your office. And the next day I came into the office and on my chair was a note. This note right here, I'm going to read it to you. It was from your, from your pad. It said, Steve, still on a, not yet on a last name. <laughs> you said, yo, you can tell a story and write, my friend. I'm, I've barely dipped into your stuff. I've been trying to get ready for a trip, but I love what I've read, Tom. And Tom, I'm just going to tell you, man, I carried that note with me for years, for years. And it, uh, it made such a huge difference, and it probably took you five seconds to write it. And, you know, in given, given what you're focusing well, thank on. Thank you for what you just said. Let me interrupt only to that point. I really appreciate your response. Well, well, you're welcome. And, you know, for, for a guy like you who reaches, has reached million, no, no exaggeration, millions of people over the years, um, it's, it might be easy for you to forget the personal impact that you can have, you know, the individual personal impact that you can have on people. But given what you're, what you're writing about now, um, this is, this ex it's exactly to the point. This is, this is what you're focusing on. So I want to read you, uh, uh this is, uh, I want everybody to hear this simple quote from the introduction to, to the new book, or at least the, the pre-released version of the book, you said, and I quote, people are not part of the show or an important part of the show. People are the show. That's my 43 years in a nutshell. It's all about the people. Yeah. And the connection. Well, yeah, I, you know, I, I do the, I'm not really very good at this sort of thing. I say somewhere there that the word human resources should be removed from, or the term human resources should be removed from the English language because I am not a human resource. And the way I always say it is, well, let me tell you about human resources. I was an only child born on November 7th, 1942, in the middle of the night. And so my father finally got in to see my mother early in the morning. And there I was, his only child. And he looked at my mother and he said, ah, Evelyn, finally our own little human resource. <laughs> he did not say that. And, and you know, I, and I got, I, there's something else I think I wrote in another paragraph or down there that said some guy wrote something and he was, he was saying people are our number one asset. And I said, no, it's just as bad. I'm not an asset, I'm Tom. And if I do good work for you, I will be doing good work as Tom, not an asset. But you, I mean, you do this for a living, you're at least as good at it as I am. Those are insanely important things. I, I need to tell you, say one thing on the little note that you were kind enough to say, a guy, I don't know if you met him or not, who attended a seminar of mine was from 3M. I still remember his name. It was Tate Elder. And he came to some reunion and he had retired. And, you know, we were talking about thank you notes or something. He said, let me tell you the power of a thank you note. He said, a guy came up to me. Uh, this is, th you know, 3M, tough engineering company. He said, a guy came up to me and thanked me for a thank you note that I had sent him 15 years ago that he still had framed and hanging on his cubicle wall. 
And now some people who are listening to us, probably not because of the selectivity of the people who listen to you, some people would say that's the biggest crock of crap in the world. And I would stand in front of them and yawn like crazy, you know, doesn't surprise me. Exactly. I mean, I got lucky. I mean, I, I got lucky and, you know, I've, I've always said the number one key to my success was the, the correct choice of parents. Uh, and one thing my mother was a fanatic about was the two words, thank you. My mm. description of it is you're opening presents at Christmas time. You're halfway through the presents. She calls a stop and you sit down and you write the thank you notes for the first half before you can start opening. And that's almost true. So doesn't it kind of blow your mind, Tom, that here we are sitting in 2021 and we're still talking about thank you notes? I mean, sh shouldn't this be just ridiculously obvious to everybody? And it's just for some reason not, at least not in the context of business. Why do you think that is? Well, I'd love to blame it all on business schools, but probably only 85 percent of it. Uh <laughs> Well, in the practical terms that we deal with, and then I'll try to circle back to the philosophic, uh, hiring practices are all screwed up. We quote a guy in the book whose name is Peter Miller, and he founded and runs a successful biotech company called Optinos. And his wonderful one-liner was, we only hire nice people. Hmm. And he went on to say, I mean, that's fine. But the part that was really important to me is he said, as you can imagine, being a biotech company, we have some slots that are only fillable by people who have a blah bitty blah bitty blah bitty degree when you can't even pronounce the words in their degree. And he said, but I learned a funny thing. Even with that degree, there are a lot of people who have it. Don't hire the jerks. And I really, you know, I'm not necessarily a fan of the, EQ test that Goldman has, but in terms of, of EQ, emotional quotient, my, and I'm, you know, I'm an old fart now, and I'm really rude about this in the book, hire for EQ, 100% of jobs. And if you hire for EQ, 100% of jobs, multiply that by 10 in your selection of managers. And in particular, one of the things I say that I religiously believe is the number one asset in any company is its first line managers. And there's enough research to support that point to sink a large ship, not a small ship. But, you know, if, 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 you, if I think people can get better at these things, but on the other hand, it would help a lot if we would hire nice people. Um, and it's not that hard. And, 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 and you know, then he goes on because it is a middle sized company. He says, listen, that old one-liner is true. One rotten apple boils the basket. And he said, I'm so intense about the culture of this organization that I can't take a chance on that. But I don't know, Steve. I mean, that's why, you know, I said, I said somewhere in the book probably is I said, look, I've written now 19 books and my family would love to have you buy all 19 because the royalty stream would be good but here's my dirty little secret. They're all about exactly the same thing. So you really don't need to bother. Just pick one randomly off the shelf. And let's just go for the new one. Yeah, let's, no. I'm always all for that. But you know, it's uh, it's really it's really true. And uh, so good. Let me let me ask you a question about that. One of the um, uh, the things that one of your lists in in this new book is. What do you call your your seven commandments leadership amidst soul crushing tumult? And they are these be kind, be caring, be patient, be forgiving, be present, be positive, walk in the other person's shoes. The phrase that I'm hearing a lot now is actually kind of building on uh, it's related to the, the title excellence now. And if I could put parentheses behind now, it's the words more than ever. So what I'm hearing is now more than ever, these things are important. Well, not only that, but in, I don't think crude terms is really the right choice of words. The other point that I'm making, the way that you behave during this period of time, going back to maybe last March, 
the way that you behave, Ms. or Mr. Leader, during these 18 months will define who you are as a pers professional human being for your whole effing life. This is the ball game, dude. Because? And, you know, the other part of me relative to that list, which, you know, I don't know where it came from, but I don't think it's all bad, uh, <laughs> is I said, you know, we've got this list and the list is, you know, very shorthand, be kind, be caring, be patient, forgiving. I said, really, uh, I can reduce it all to four words. And the four words are, don't be an asshole. Yeah. And, and what you just said and what you preached for a long time is, it's really a good thing not to be an asshole in general, but it's, it's a good thing times a thousand right now. One, you know, one of my smart aleck remarks is you're a boss. Zoom meetings are your thing. Uh, one of the women or guys has got three kids at home and everything else. And so, you know, you show up right on time for a meeting. You're that guy. And I look you in the eye and I say, Farber, I am giving you a bad review for this meeting. And I'm giving you a bad review because you showed up on time for the ninth straight meeting. And I know damn well the shit you're having to deal with at home. And so feel free to miss the meeting, come late to the meeting or what have you. But as far as I'm concerned, nine on time arrivals in a row, that's bad behavior. And you know, you mean it, but, but it is that yeah. attitude. Yeah. And, and we do a crappy job of selecting people we really, really do a lousy job on the first line managers, I think. And it's that old thing, and you've said it, and I've said it a hundred times. We promote somebody because of their technical skill. They can add one and one and get two faster than anybody else and not their people skill. And leadership is, you know, sorry for all that time you invested, Tom, getting your Cornell engineering degree, but now you're a leader and Here's the percentage of your job, which is about people, 100, no rounding error. Right. Yeah, as our, as our colleague Dick Heller used to say, uh, what, what happens a lot is that people get really good at job A, and they're so good at job A, they're promoted to job B, which is managing the people who do job A. And it's an entirely different, entirely yeah. different, no. not only is it a different skill set, it's a different, um, it's a different attitude and a different level of connection, right? Yeah, uh, here's, I'll answer, maybe it is that engineering, always with a number, and then really give you a good answer. There's a little vignette somebody sent me that I put in the book, and there is an agency, this was in a University of Pennsylvania article, an agency that does home services for the elderly, but in a way that's kind of technical. You do to some point kind of like a, you know, nursing assistant or PA or what have you. Uh, and in this charming business, the average turnover is roughly 70%. So this group said, let's see if we can figure out a way to hire people who stick around. And so they changed their hiring practices. And one of the things that was part of being hired was you went to a little social engagement. And, you know, and I'm working for the organization and I look for such things as, does Farber really listen? Um, you know, when he listens, is he paying attention to me? Is he, when somebody else starts to talk, does he shut up even if they were talking over him? Um, and a dozen, dozen things like that. And then they also ask, uh, you know, what's your, away from the workplace, what's your community involvement? And you don't have to be a scout leader, or you don't have to be the head of this or that, but you need, what are you doing in the community to make the community a little bit better? So as they use the precise words, they said, we started hiring more, we started hiring less on degrees and more on these personal attitudes. And for those who like numbers, and this is a nice precise one with a de decimal point, the average turnover in 18 months went from 70% to 1.7%. Mm -hmm. A, the number of hospitalizations of their clients dropped by about 40%. The length of the hospitalizations of the clients who had to go to the hospital 
went that length of stay went down by 25%. And, you know, and, and I believe those numbers. And I believe that, well, the other one, oh, God, I love this, Steve. And I'm so delighted. Sorry, I called you Steve. Love this, <laughs> comma, Farber. Uh, and I wish I, you know, I'm so delighted it's in the book. Uh, there was a study reported, Google did a study of its best employees and its best teams. And Google doesn't F around on things like that. So it was thorough, methodical, da 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 Eight factors associated with best employees. First seven were soft stuff. You know, does she listen? Does he contribute? Is he respectful of other people's views? And number eight on the list was STEM. And then they did the same thing for teams. And Google is one of those disgusting places that ranks you and I as an A player or a B player. Right. And the wonderful thing in innovation was the B, B teams beat the hell out of the A teams. Same stuff. I respect your idea. And particularly in a techie world like that, one of the ones at the top of the list in the B teams was no bullying. But once again, and I mean, it sounds like it came out so perfectly, eight traits, seven of them the soft stuff. And I love it that that's as, you know, the fact that it was great in this home services company is unbelievably fabulously wonderful. The fact that the same damn thing holds down to the dotting of the I's and the crossing of the T's in the techiest of tech firms known to humankind, that's lovely. It's like, you can't hide from me, dude. You can't say, well, you can get away with that with home services. You can't do it in my world. Well, you can do it in my world. <laughs> well, you know, it's that, part of it too, yeah. which is the wrong, what is, which you, I'm sure you read in the book and you've heard me say for a million years relative to my world is uh, the world would be a hell of a lot better off if women were running it. Yeah. We've already seen that during COVID, but you know, I believe the, the same thing is true times, whatever in the world of enterprise. Uh, and again, what I love because I do have that kind of a hard nosed background on issues like women as better leaders, uh, find me a container ship and I'll fill it up with studies which support that point. It's not, it's, it ain't anecdotal, dude. Yeah. So why, why do you think that is? Is it just because of a, a more natural uh, desire among women generally, I know I'm overgeneralizing, uh, more of a natural desire to connect and be present with other people or what, what's going on there? I think that's good, but let, I have to put an asterisk on it because yeah. I always get in trouble. When I say the research says women are by a long shot better leaders than men, and I am so clear about this because I get beaten up, I am talking about a bell-shaped curve. Right. There are very shitty women leaders and there are incredible men leaders but on average, yeah. the woman leader is, and, and I always have to put that asterisk because somebody nails me to the wall appropriately. Um, if I don't, I think it is more attention to one's fellow human being. There's another, my favorite book title in a long time is something written by a woman by the name of Luann Lofton, who is at Motley Fool. And the title of the book is Warren Buffett invests like a girl and why you should too. Hmm. Uh, women beat the hell out of men on investments. And the main reason is because men get into their bloody competitive things and they take long shots on shit. Yeah. And women are a lot more steady. But, you know, it, and, and what's really important to this little bit of our conversation was one of the biggest studies which uh, was in, reported in the Harvard Business Review. It was done by a guy who I know well. You may know him, Jack Zenger. Uh, women outscored men on 12 of 16 traits. But what they said and underlined, including the traits that are thought of as the hard traits, like delivering results. You deliver better results if you have a team of people who gets along and is, yeah. is appreciated. My, but my favorite other thing is... Uh, there's a, another Luann, Luann Brizendine. She's a university, Southern, university of San Francisco, whatever, the, the, health, the medical school, UCSF, University of right. California, San Francisco. Um, and she's a neuropsychologist, psychiatrist. She wrote a book called The Female Brain. And it has a jillion details, but the one 
that I love and I believe I'm accurate by the age of five days your identical sister twin is making three times more eye contact with her fellow human being than you are. And, you know, I, I don't know how the people who are watching us or listening into us will think, but that, that to me is like a bomb going off. Yeah. You know, it, it revealed itself at the 72 hour mark. Well, you know, it also reminds me of Kuzis and Posner's research. Um, and this was from a while ago, so I'd be curious to see if they've if they've updated this particular element of it. You know, they they have their five practices of exemplary exemplary leaders, not easy to say. And what they found is when they when they did the comparison between men and women, that there were on, on those five practices, on four of the five practices, they were essentially even across the board. But on the practice that they call encouraging the heart, women scored higher than men. So according to their model, all five of the practices are important. You have to do all of them. Ergo, women in general are better leaders because they score higher in that one. Yeah. And it's that it's that heart connection. You know, I as you know, I I, you know, I wrote a book called Love is Just Damn Good Business, and people are not accustomed to um, to hearing that word in the business context. And they're even less accustomed to hearing it from a guy who who looks like me. So, I mean, I've literally had people come up to me after a speech and say, um, yeah, I uh, it took me a while to 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 kind of figure out what you were saying, because I was confused because here, you, you, you know, you stepped out on stage, you, you look like a like a football player and you're talking about love. And I, I just had to get my mind around that. My point is that the, st- the, st- the stereotype is that this love and connection and compassion and caring and eye contact and presence, that's all women's stuff that guys have to learn. But it's that's not really the case. There's just there, there's 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 apparently some kind of societal something leaning, or maybe it's societal, maybe it's biological, that that gives women a bit of an edge in that. But it's human stuff. It's not male female stuff. Yeah. Well, that one thing I'm sure you know this quote, but it's one of my favorite ones of all, which speaks exactly to your word. Uh, a guy who's a lot was a lot tougher than you was uh, former Green Bay Packers coach Vince Lombardi, who just was a, just a touch, just a Bill, touch. Bill, Bill Belichick on steroids. He was a really good one. And what, my favorite Lombardi line was, you do not have to like your players, but you must love them. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and I just thought that was one of the, you know, I mean, that, that kind of brings me to tears. My only problem with, with Jim and Barry's conclusion which I buy, obviously, is most of the research says the women outscore the men on damn near everything. Hmm. There's one. There's a big study by a guy by the name of Lawrence Faff, P-F-A-F-F, that, that I report. And he, in a big study, a lot of people, high end and all that sort of stuff, women outscored men on 20 out of 20 traits. But as he said, now, wait a minute, let me give you a break. Only 15 of the 20 were with statistical significance. Mm. Uh, and so I, I, I don't, you know, as you know, I adore both Jim and Barry, but I don't want to, because we're often dealing with tough guys, I don't want to fall into the trap. I want to say women are better at boy shit. Yeah, exactly. As well as, you know, they, they, are, they are tough as hell, but they – Anyway, no, I it's uh, um, I agree with you. I love your book title. Uh, I have a term that I guess it's not quite as clean as love that I use in that list of forty three, and then in the big book, and it's what I call the number number one trait of effective leaders, and it is called give a shitism. Yeah, right. <laughs> 
And I, I, I stole it in a way. There was a guy I knew really well. His name was Barry Gibbons. And he was a Brit and he ran this thing called Chef and Brewer for one of the big companies. And he came to the United States and he ran Burger King and you know, he turned it around. And, and, and I remember in his, in his autobiography, he, he said, I didn't have a vision for Burger King. I didn't have a mission statement for Burger King. What I wanted was 250,000 employees from the checkout line to the accounting line, 250,000 employees, each of whom gave a shit. Mm -hmm. And so I stole directly from Barry or indirectly from Barry. And, uh, but I'm going to go back to this thing that we said 20 minutes ago. Uh, practical, pragmatic, hire for it, promote for it. I do believe that you can become a better listener or I can become a better listener, but it would really be nice to start on the opponent's 20 yard line instead of your own 20 yard line to use football language the day before the Super Bowl, uh, two days before the Super Bowl, whatever. Uh, and and I'm not a good macroeconomist. I don't, I don't know what we're going to do with all the unkind people. Uh, but, you know, I think it's also uh, so uh, the the message about hiring, you know, hiring people who give a shit, hiring people who who like people. Um, however, you test for that, whether it's inviting them to a party like you talked about or some kind of assessment or just getting just seeing if they make eye contact you with you during an yeah, interview. Absolutely. Um, but but there's also, I believe, a responsibility on the level of the, the company, the leaders in the company to do the best they can to create an environment that people are going to love working in because yeah. I can hire great people and then, and then just squash them with, with the wrong, the wrong kind of culture. Oh, no question. You know, one of the, one of the people who we reported in, in the last book, and again, is a guy by the name of Richard Sheridan, who uh, is in Ann Arbor and runs a software sizable software company. And he wrote a book and the book is called joy Inc. J O Y comma I N C period. Mm -hmm. And he said, joy is our core value. Uh, it's the only value that really matters. And, you know, you read that stuff and you say, well, I'll see it when I believe it. Well, I saw it and I believed it. Yeah. And, and, and you're, you're absolutely right about that. Uh, well, it kind of reminds me of the, the old, the, the, the classic um, Rosenbluth's book, uh, The Customer Comes Second. Remember that one? Yeah. How, yeah. How? Lo lovely how. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and. And the, the premise there, again, way back then, just as true, if not more true today, is that uh, if if you build a culture and a team where your employees come first, then your customers end up coming first. <laughs> yeah, my my very sophisticated, fine English line for that was, if you want to wow the customer first, you got to wow the person who wows the customer. Yeah, exactly. And you know, that's the, that's absolutely, well, the other thing is relative to that book, there's a, there's another book that came out uh, two or three years ago, uh, same kind of deal. And it's called putting the patient second. And in a lot of hospitals, uh, everybody or most everybody is, you know, treated like chattel. And, uh, and, and the thing, you know, funny little stories, uh, and not every CEO has to do this. One of the two authors was a MD CEO. And so he takes over a hospital. And I guess it was in the summer. And so they had a big kind of picnic. And at the picnic, and I think I've seen some of these things, there was a, something where you could throw a ball at something. And if it hit it, there was a person sitting on a chair who got dumped. Right. Yeah. Well, the CEO did that and he was a guy on the chair, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, just, just you know, I imagine people were a little shy at, at times and they weren't throwing it at him. They were throwing him at that target. Right. It right. Was. right. But I just love the fact, you know, that he, that he did it. And, and it is really cool and it re is really impactful. Um, uh, but I don't know, Steve. I said Harbor. I said this is <laughs> I answered, my I, I do recognize both of those. I know you do, but I feel badly <laughs> because I know your name is Farber.
I think we hired you when you were Steve, but you know, <laughs> and one day you came into my office and showed me your passport where you had reversed your names legally, uh, which I thought was just fine with me. Um, I don't, I, <laughs> I don't know why we have to have this conversation. Exactly. You know, well, I mean, that's, I, you know, that's, somebody that's... want to understand. I said, I got two degrees in engineering and two degrees in business, all both from good schools. I said, if you want to understand my work, you have to show me a certificate of graduation from the third grade. <laughs> it ain't intellectual. Right. You know, yeah. It ain't intellectual. Which which brings me back to this this phrase now more than ever, because here, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've had the same response. When the pandemic hit and you know people were, were locked down and, and the isolation set in and the, the uncertainty and the fear and all that stuff, uh, I started hearing that now more than ever, compassion is important. Now more than ever, connection is important. Now more than ever, love is important. And my response to that was, it's <laughs> it's always been important. It's not like suddenly out of nowhere, these these great revelations, but, but what's have happened, but what, what has happened is that our current circumstance has brought it to the forefront. So we're getting less resistance now, I think, to this conversation. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I would say. It's, it, it's 100%. It always has been 100%. But maybe in extremis, we can get more people to listen. And then as I've heard a lot of people say, including myself and I'm sure you, then we can pray that what happened that was quite a bit more humane during COVID-19 times will last. Yes. When we put it, maybe, maybe it'll be a, a bit of a, of a, of a high Richter earthquake in the direction of more humane uh, leadership. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. I'm also, um, you know, I'll admit that I'm, I'm at my core a perpetual optimist and I'll tend to err on the side of 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 a rosier picture versus a, a more dire one. So so I I believe that a lot of this will stick when we go back to to normal um, in terms of how we communicate and travel, et, et cetera. And I also see how short of an attention span we have and how quickly we forget circumstances that happened a week ago, a month ago, and then suddenly they have a different meaning than they did when we were in the middle of it. So that part concerns me, but but I, I really do believe, and I, I'd like to get your take on this, that when, when you focus it in a business context, that as business people, we, we have this great opportunity to create whatever it is that we want as as kind of a microcosm of what's possible in the world at large. So we can set the, as business people, we could set the example for the rest of the world. And, and not only could we, but I think we should, because we have a lot more control over what's going on in our business. I'm not sure that this is the people who are listening to us or watching us, uh, but there's a one important asterisk to what we're saying and I don't think you're quite as bad at this as I used to be, but the quote unquote management guru set tends to focus on the fortune 500. Right. And that's their reference point. The reality is 6% of Americans work for the fortune 500 and 94% don't. And, you know, and everybody works for a business or 85% of us. It's, it's, you know, what I wrote, I said, business is not part of the community. It is the community, like yes. the organization thing. And I'm, 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 I'm afraid to say my cynicism level at my age is pretty high. Uh, I'm not that hopeful about the fortune 500. Uh, the good news is I don't give a shit about the fortune 500. Uh, you know, the, the, the person I want to influence, you know, the SMEs, the small and medium sized enterprises is the person running a 30 person shop or a six person shop or an 80 person shop. And I think my bias and I think I'm correct. You and I have a much higher chance of, quote unquote, selling the message to that person 
uh, in part because she or he can see huge differences in a short period of time in a widespread way in an 80 person organization, let alone a 10 person organization. But, you know, yeah. it, it really, it's really important to focus, you know, I'm coming, I'm shouting it myself to, to, to focus on where the people are and the people are not in the fortune 500 companies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my, I had an old McKinsey friend, his name is Dick Foster and he and his colleagues did a, uh, longitudinal study of the thousand biggest companies. And these guys are more quantitative than me, even in my dreams. They did 40 years performance and not one company, these are publicly traded, not one company outperformed the market over a 40 year period. Hmm. You know, the notion of a really good big company is, is, a, is a joke to me. There was this wonderful line from an economist and I can't get it out of my head. He said, I'll get it wrong in which case it won't work at all. But it's basically how, how I want to start a company. How, how do I build a good small company? I think that was it. How do I build a good small company? And, and the response was, oh, it's simple. Buy a big one and just wait. And, <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and, and, and statistically, to, there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, it's it's more more true, more truer, truer than truer. we'd like Maybe to think. Maybe even truerist. Well, and, and, and to your point, it's one thing, it, it is true, and I do find myself focusing more on small to mid-sized organizations. And for the reason you said, and then some, the reason you said was it's easier to sell the message to, to a woman running a, you know, a hundred person shop. Not only that, it's easier to help that person implement the message and actually change the company and get results. Yeah. So we've seen, you know, uh, to give a shameless plug for, for my team, um, using the, these love, you know, operationalizing love concepts, not concepts of practices, uh, we've helped quite a few companies make it onto best place to work list. And, and what is it that they have in common? They have hundred people, 200 people in, in them. Right. So they're not, yeah. they're not competing with, you know, fortune 100 best place to work. They're competing with other companies about their size to get on yeah. that list. But because it's just, it's kind of obvious you can make significant change in your company when it's smaller and, and fast and, and faster. And the caveat is to that, that even in big companies, if if I can, as a as a leader within, say a a, 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 a an Apple, let's say, um, I do have influence over my team, and I yep. can. And it's not like every company has a a culture. Like every every place in Amazon is the same the same culture, and you know all the negative press they're getting about their culture. My team within Amazon, for example, can have an entirely different culture. They can have that because of my influence and what we do together. Nancy Austin and I co-wrote A Passion for Excellence in 1985, and our term for that was Pockets of Excellence. Yeah. And, and I also remember in that first book in 82, one of the companies we focused on was an auto parts company, Difficulties Today, called the Dana Corporation out of Toledo, and their boss was a guy by the name of Ren McPherson. And Ren taught me what you're saying, he said, he said, look, he said, I had my factory. I had my division. Nobody can stop me from making it a great place to work. And he said, they wanted to stop me, but <laughs> my results were much better. So they couldn't fire me. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, you know, laugh line, but it's, it was actually the way, you know, the way that I, I will I will say, and I you know we don't have time to talk about everything. Um, this is too long a conversation. It's there are people who have to be let go because they don't fit. Yeah, and we could talk for an hour about that. Uh, you know, the McKinsey way for all the problems McKinsey is having, but in, in my day was give people a second chance, give people a third chance give people a fourth chance, give people a fifth chance, give people a sixth chance. And if we're still not getting anywhere, then time to go. 
Yeah. But and, and I, I and, remembered that, that as somebody who didn't know whether I'd be on the winning or losing side of that, even then, and I didn't have the training, I really appreciated the fact that they didn't toss somebody out on their ear. You know, they kept Farber around for another year and he was the biggest jerk in the world, but they didn't toss him out to the wolves, you know, uh, in, in short order. And, and that's also part of the process of decency. Yeah. Of and then, and then, you're right. That is a whole other conversation because then, then you get into that whole dynamic of, yeah, but to what degree is that jerk affecting the performance of the other people around? Absolutely. Him? So, that's the- but, but there is, you know, there is such a thing as tough love. And sometimes love, sometimes love looks like, um, let's call it uh, liberating a person from this company to find their purpose elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, 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 has to be has to be done. But so, uh, again, so as, again, as to do my broken record act again, you do a lot better if you hire them for people who, you know, hire people you get off on. For God's sakes! Uh oh, I've got to add an asterisk to all this, and I've thought about it three times, and I know that you're the most brilliant author in the world, and I know that I'm <laughs> one of the most brilliant authors in the world. Well, keep, keep working 20, at it, Tom. You'll get there. <laughs> the 21st century, my favorite business book by a country mile, written by a woman named Susan Cain, has a one-word title, which is quiet, Q-U-I-E-T. And she makes the case for introverts. And, you know, I just, in my book, one of the, I would, was, was dedicated in part to her, and I said in my little dedication paragraph, I love Susan Cain because she made me feel like a true ass. You know, that fundamentally that I had been conned by the people who were noisy and which means, and boy, I loved it after the book came out to be able to pound on people means I'm ignoring 45% of the population. Yeah. That's criminal and stupid. Yeah. Uh, But you know, her book on introverts, anybody who doesn't buy it, read it, then read it again and then read it again. It is just, so powerful and so clean. I mean, it's not a complicated issue in this and that and the other. Uh, and it, it really is, it is life changing. Well, we'll, we'll, um, we'll find it and put the link, put the link to it along with. Yeah, I, I just love it. Susan's yeah. great. Yeah. You know, she, and she has, she's trained as a lawyer. So, you know, she's not, not a, not a softy. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm sensitive to your time. I want to start to bring this in for a landing. We should, probably should have booked a week for this conversation. I, I, would, have, I would have loved that. Yeah, uh, we could do that. No, you got better things to do, but I would have loved that. Um, I want to... No, I know, because this is, this is what I have lived for. You know, we said, you said that book, 43 Number Ones. The number 43 was not chosen lightly. Uh, 43 years ago, I began the research that led to where... I am today. You know, that's, that was the reason for the 43 years, 43 years of saying, take care of people and good things will happen to your bottom line. And, you know, St. Peter will let you in the gate when it's all over. Yawn, third grade diploma. Yeah, that's right. I want to, I I want, I want to circle back on the, on the nostalgia wheel. Just, just one more time before, before we wrap this up, one of uh, the, there are two. So, First of all, I want to say that having this conversation with you now after um, being out there working with my own body of work, you know, I went off on my own and left left the Tom Peters company in 2000. I mean, it's been a long time. And uh, it's just a wonderful reminder having this conversation with you, how deeply informed my work is by you and the ideas that I learned from you at the formative time in my career. Um, which and those those really were uh, they were incredible years for me uh, in in a lot of ways. I was only there for six years, Real but, but you know really really significant in a lot of ways. Um, but I remember so first of all my my all time favorite Tom Peters quote I would like to share with you, uh, which I still which I still put in. Am I going to be okay when this is over? <laughs> you're going to be you're going to be fine. Uh, my 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 favorite quote. And it was from an interview that you did somewhere. I don't even think it was from a book. It was from an interview. You said, the, and I quote, if your company is having trouble attracting fabulous people, it's because your company sucks. 
which I just think is just freaking hey, brilliant. Good, just, good for me. It's, it's classic <laughs> Peterzian wisdom. Uh, but then my, my, my little bit of nostalgia is I vividly remember a company meeting that we were having. In fact, I, I remember the venue. I remember the I remember the whole scenario. It was in in Scottsdale, Arizona. We were out there doing uh, as a team. We were doing a big project for Sun Microsystems, and then we we tagged our company meeting at the back of it. And then you came in to say hello and and kind of you know inspire the troops. <laughs> and you said, <laughs> and I quote, "Repeat business is for wimps." <laughs> if we're not if we're not pissing our clients off to the point where they don't want us back we are not doing our jobs and it was oh my gosh i remember uh laughing so hard that i was hardly able to breathe and then looking around at at some of the faces of like boyd clark and ron crossland <laughs> the guys who were running the company at the time <laughs> and they go like well this is probably not the best growth strategy <laughs> for our company <laughs> Oh my gosh. <clears throat> so, so just, um, I just, I wanted you to hear that little bit of nostalgia, but having looked back and seeing where we are now, as you, as you look ahead into a post pandemic world, which no doubt about it will come. <laughs> um, what, what are you thinking? Where, where are we headed in, in, let's, and let's talk about the, you know, the, the business world overall. And I know this is going to be almost impossible uh, for me to ask you to do, but just a, a couple minute taste of that, where you think we're headed. Well, let's not talk about we, let's talk about the company you and I run or own or what have you. The two words that are in the title of the new book are extreme humanism. And, you know, we've had the pandemic, we've had the racial, we ha are having the pandemic, we are being more aware of the racial injustice. Uh, but before that awareness took place, or before the pandemic took place, what we had and what we have is an artificial intelligence tsunami heading at us at an incredible speed. A couple of guys from Oxford at a study which said 50% of American white collar jobs will be at risk during the next 20 years. So we, we've got that big one. And a lot of the argument of the book is that we can succeed with great people making great products. And one of the things, and it gets left out, and I wish we did have more time, is I really focus on the number one differentiator being extraordinary design. And not meaning pretty, but you know, Johnny Ive, who was the former Apple design chief said, products and services that make the world just a teeny bit better. And I think that really, so, and that's being human. That's humanizing our products and humanizing our services. And so I want to say that, and then I want to say something that's not contradictory, but sort of is. Uh, given AI, I can imagine an incredible amount of shit hitting the fan over the next 20 years. And we probably will need universal basic income and so on. But what I also remind people when they go on a rant about this is to have a problem 20 years from now, we've got to get through the first 19 years. And so the first question is, you know, what do I do on the 6th of February, 2021? What do I do on the 6th of February, 2022? And I think there will be dramatic change, but I'm kind of a short termer in that regard. And I think this is also very consistent with the, with the message of love. My, comment meant to be provocative is small is almost always more important than big. Mm -hmm. It is the tiny touch. I used, I wish I had the book at hand. Uh, I used as my epigraph for the entire book for the little big things in 2010, a quote from Henry Clay, the statesman. And it said something like it is the small courtesies which stick in the mind the longest. 
And, you know, the way I translate that into our everyday work is I don't have to thank Farber when he got a million dollar sales. Everybody's going to tell him he walks on water. It's thanking Farber because he was busier than hell. And Jane, who's his next door neighbor at work, was killing herself for a deadline. And even though Farber was dead on his butt, he spent a day really helping Jane do her thing or Jane that did her day. It's the, it's the little stuff. It's, it's, you know, little, little stuff beats big stuff a hundred to one. And so, you know, I'm, I get a little weary of disruptions and, and that sort of thing. Just, you know, and, you know, and again, it's, it's uh, not so wintry in San Diego as it, as it is here on the East coast. But I said, my definition of love or a little thing or whatever you want is it's a really crappy day outside and you're the boss of a nine person organization and on the way to work, you stop and you buy a bunch of flowers and you take the flowers to work and you put them in a vase and there's just a teeny bit more color. And it, th those are the things which, you know, with, with our kids and with our families and, uh, you know, the, 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 those are, that's the memorable stuff. It's that guy I talked about earlier on who, had a little handwritten thank you note still on his walls yeah. a dozen years later. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's not an anomaly. That is the it's norm. Not. Yeah. And to remind you, this note from 1994. Still in my know. possession. Not this is, this is the sound. Problem that it means I'm responsible for all your bloody books. <laughs> in large Which, part, if yes. it were true, I would be thrilled <laughs> out of my mind because I, I do love the stuff you do and I love your. I love your taking the world love, word love, and if this isn't an inappropriate thing to say, operationalizing it yeah, in the exactly. best sense of that word. Yeah. And really giving people the the opportunity to understand that well, and it's, you know, I know I know I'm really old, but resume virtues versus eulogy virtues is a big deal. Yeah. You know, it's what do you be remembered for? And, and, you know, on one of my slides somewhere, I've got a picture of a tombstone and on it, it says $17,382,615.14 when the market closed the day he died. There's never been a tombstone with net worth on it. <laughs> that's great. That's, and that's not what. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what a great place to, uh, to bring this conversation for a landing. Tom, uh, I can't thank you enough. This was this was so wonderful uh, for so many different reasons, and I'm sure our listeners are gonna are going to love this and and come back to it many times. And we'll put all the links to your to your new book, to the website, and all that in the show notes, so people know where to find you, uh, and of course to follow you on Twitter, where you're spending a lot of your time uh, nowadays, or at least some of it. Um, it's just just been wonderful. Thanks so much for being with me, man. No, no, thank you. It's it's it's. Sorry, it's not face to face. It is fabulous to see you. And uh, I appreciate all the things you did for me. And now all the things you're doing for the world and for your clients and for your workmates. You're, you're a good guy, Farber. Well, thank you. Or at Tom. least you have some good days every now and then, which is <laughs> I, the most you ask for in life. That, that's, that sounds like a good thing to put on a tombstone. Thanks. Yeah, Tom. absolutely. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to another episode of Love is Just Damn Good Business with Steve Farber. Join us again next time because when customer and employee satisfaction just isn't enough anymore, we are here to back you up with specific ideas to operationalize love to make an enormous difference in your business, personal life, and the world around you. Visit our website at stevefarber.com to leave a review. And don't forget to share the love with your colleagues and friends because after all, it's just damn good business.